Right, uh, good evening all. I thought I'd give you an update on a whole variety of different fronts. So I've got uh, Lineker, the BBC, Independent Media, the European Movement Chair Contest, and also Horizon and what's going on with that. So I thought I'd just go through all of that and have a catch up because we haven't in a while and cover all of these topics. The, the Gary Lineker thing, of course, is absolutely fascinating because it's developed so fast. Ironically, his original tweet is something that uh, could easily have gone unnoticed uh, were it not for uh, predominantly the tabloid press deciding to, um, and, and conservative MPs, deciding to pick it up and run with it. Because it's not the first time Gary Lineker has said exactly what he thinks uh, about politics or any other presenters uh, who've said exactly what they think about politics as well, whether it be Chris Packham or Lord Sugar or whoever, um, have said very blatant uh, partisan things or, or, or critical things right throughout their careers. So, um, and also the way that Gary Lineker said it, he wasn't, you know, they're just like the Nazis. He was clearly talking about the preconditions uh, of fascism. But the fascinating th thing here is how it's developed to be a massive backfiring now because it has exposed how the BBC oftentimes works and that is it is usually led by the nose by tabloid press and also conservative politicians. Oftentimes you'll, you'll get um, the BBC not seeming to really set its own agenda but taking its cue of what the front pages of the tabloids are. And then that determines what's being talked about or what um, the, the uh, government has been sort of pushing their way very heavily. And we've seen this, this increasing control of the BBC by this government developing. And so what has happened now is it looks like the tabloid press and uh, angry conservative MPs have led the BBC by the nose again, right into a real trouble spot for the BBC, which is then also going to backfire on the government and their original plans. Because now everybody is talking about the trouble that Richard Sharp is in with the fact uh, that he paid vast sums of money into uh, the Conservative Party. He lent, uh, so ar helped arrange that loan for Boris Johnson, which is currently being investigated, which he didn't declare. And then you've got other actors like the director general of uh, the BBC, uh, Tim Davey, having previously been um, within the Conservative Party structures. And of course, then factoring what Maitlis was saying, Emily Maitlis was saying about Robbie Gibb being an active uh, Tory agent within the BBC. It's just brought it all back to that. And the sense of kind of like your impartiality seems only to go uh, one way. That looked absolutely dead clear. And so now with uh, so many of the presenters rallying behind um, uh, Gary Lineker, uh, the BBC is really, really stuck as to why it has behaved, how it has behaved with those links to the Conservative Party. Uh, that is absolutely all on show. It looks bad. And basically, uh, Davy and uh, the the chair, Richard Sharp, should resign because the confidence that the public have in the BBC is now nosediving. And that this blows things up for the original uh, thing that uh, uh, the, the tabloid press and the Conservatives were trying to silence uh, Lineker on, and that is their own absolutely abysmal plans as to how to treat uh, asylum seekers. And you're even getting the likes of Tobias Elwood within the Conservative Party saying that he wants to see that um, asylum seekers have an option to make an, an actual request before coming to these shores. So it, it's starting to break within the Conservative Party um, about their whole um, uh, uh, strategy as well. and. They had, they had wanted to really start a culture war about this, develop a massive wedge issue on this, because Keir Starmer has been tacking close to the Tories as he can, 
um, so that there isn't any clear blue water between them going into the next general election. So what the Conservative Party has been looking for is some kind of uh, place they can go that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party will not follow. And then they can use that as a wedge issue. But they've gone so far right here that this wedge issue has become a massive problem for them. Um, and it's and it's actually opened up the culture wars that they wanted, but it's backfiring on them heavily. So there's um, this is really um, fascinating. And um, I'm loving uh, so many people calling out the government on this um, because it is absolutely abysmal what they're doing and why they're doing it. Right. And that kind of brings me on to independent media. You can see from this, but you can also see from, for example, uh, Matt Hancock's leaked WhatsApp uh, messages that um, the, the relationship between politicians and media is really, really unhealthy in so many places. We already know that, that in this country, uniquely in Europe, our media is massively distrusted. And it's this interweaving that we have between these, these uh, sort of wealthy barons and, um, and politicians that has now crept into the BBC as well. And it feels as though the whole lot is being heavily corroded and you're not getting some of the really important news about political workings. And that's why it's so important that, you know, we've got something like the Byline Times and also what we've spun out from it, this sister organization, um, Bylines Network, which now has 10 local titles. By the way, we've got a crowdfunder going out on that at the moment. So if you see it, please back it. But um, with the Bylines Network, it's based on citizen journalism. And there's so much talent out there within the citizenry, so much experience of business, of journalism, of different areas of research that we're actually getting coming through in articles as well. And the, and the fantastic thing is that once you're on social media, like Twitter or Facebook, um, people will just share articles that are good quality and hit the points uh, that, that they want to hear about or they want to read about and learn about. And so there's real space out there for a lot more independent journalism that includes citizen journalism to actually, you know, rapidly start addressing some of the stupidities that said at the national level, as well as holding power to account on local levels as well. So I, I, I just, you know, in the whole context of the BBC and corruption there, and also they're kind of like, hey, George Osborne, can you give me a splash from Matt Hancock? And how you see that through some of the leading papers as well, it just goes to show that when it comes to how we get our information via via social media or blogs or citizen journalism you know all of that is so important as well um in order to have real sort of community sharing and understanding right um so another update um em chair competition i'm currently running uh, to be chair of european movement the other two candidates my co-candidates uh, Patience Wheatcroft and uh, Tom Brake. The voting, and this is for European Movement members only, has already opened up and closes on March 20th. Um, and we've done all the hustings now. So there was one uh, hustings sort of um, uh, just over a, a sort of a week ago. And then there were Scottish and Welsh hustings as well, and one for the Midlands. And so now, we're just uh, in, in a sort of campaigning period until that in line. But I'm I'm very keen to keep reaching out to uh, to get more endorsements as we as we go along. And all three of us have got and this is very healthy. have got uh, cross party endorsements from Labour, Lib Dems, Green, um, uh, Tories, you know, the lot. All of us have got the spread. But for me, it's very important to get a lot of those grassroots groups uh, endorsements um, because uh, for so long that the, the local groups have been underappreciated and under invested in and I think that going forward um, that's what we really need to strengthen up heavily not not just to geographically sort of cover the country but so much skill and so much creativity 
comes out a lot of those local groups. That's where Brexitometers were invented. Uh, EM Staffs have got a brilliant app. You've got at the moment Leads for Europe, which has um, developed the Brexit inquiry petition, which had over 100,000 signatures. So waiting on a debate in Parliament, but we are polling for that as well, which shows that even within the Conservative Party and within Leavers, um, more people would like to see a Brexit inquiry than not as to the damage done to our economy, to our businesses and our citizens. So I'm all about um, investing in the local groups, helping them grow and expand, but also bringing volunteers much more into the structure of what happens at EM, whether that be uh, research, or whether that be media itself, because there's so much you can do with local and national media, um, whereby you can bring in the wealth of experience that we've got in the wider community. And so, I mean, that's that's why, you know, un, unlike the other candidates, because I've got so much, you know, experience with the local groups, I've just got a, a list now. I'll read the list to you because I'm quite proud of it. Uh, Leeds for Europe, Suffolk, Liverpool, Harrow and Hillingdon, Edinburgh, Swindon, Swansea, North East, Dorset, York, Spain, Wigan, South and West Yorkshire, Norfolk, Tunbridge Wells and Tonbridge, as well as other pro-EU campaigning organisations that have an interest in European movement, uh, such as National Join March Day European, 16 million rising, Veterans for Europe. Um, and so the, the real important thing here is to be able to unify all of those groups, all of those campaigning groups, um, make it really a strong, cohesive community, drive up awareness of that, develop it further, because much as it's nice to have political connections and all of us who've been in campaigning do, I learned a while ago that if you speak in a politician's ear about, you know, this, we, we really need this, this really needs to happen, they'll say, yes, 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 they'll agree with you, but they'll feel no urgency about it until they see it's in the media, until they see polling on it, um, and uh, until they uh, have their own constituents banging on about it. So it is that is that broad nationwide structure, the grassroots level, pushing, 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 and bigger and bigger organizations with more money, with more visibility, with more local groups, the size of the thing is, is what really drives it. And that's what I really want to build up. Now, uh, last item on my catch up agenda is uh, Horizon. And um, I was delighted when um, Rishi Sunak managed to do that deal over the Northern Ireland Protocol. And in that press conference with him and Ursula von der Leyen, uh, someone asked about Horizon Europe and he offered it to her. And she said, oh, it's great. You know, this sorts things. This is very exciting for, you know, uh, scientists on the continent and, and British scientists as well. Great. But then Rishi Sunak was, was sort of quieter about the issue. And then he avoided it and in when asked about it in, in, in Parliament. And then we hear that his, his humming and hawing and dithering on it. Now, this is absolutely nuts because from 2016 to 2020, we were on the Horizon programme. This was Horizon 2020. And everyone was saying, yeah, we absolutely want to stay on it. You know, Boris Johnson, you know, Theresa May, then Boris Johnson... But because of the constant threats of a no-deal Brexit, we dropped from joint first place right down to fifth place, lost 1.5 billion in cash uh, on it, and, and tons and tons of collaborative opportunities we lost. And then when Boris Johnson started kicking off about the Northern Ireland Protocol, it meant that even though we'd signed up to the new programme, Horizon Europe, at the beginning of 2021, we were forced to sit out on the bench because... Uh, the EU wanted to make sure that we were actually going to honour our contracts. And that has meant that we've dropped even further down the list, you know, earning less money in collaborations than even Belgium recently. It was nuts just waiting there. But the government waited because they didn't want to go and invest it in something else because that's plan B. And it was called plan B. And everyone knew that it wasn't as good as getting as into Horizon Europe. So then why, when you finally, after sitting it out for two years, when you finally got the opportunity to come back in, is, is Rishi Sunak humming and haring? And the point is, 
He may think it's clever um, to look at the other program, maybe use that as a negotiation leverage, um, but it is not clever because what was an enthusiastic moment has now fallen through and our scientists do not trust this government and they're getting angry at this government and they will take their collaborations or sometimes themselves elsewhere if they don't think that this government is properly backing them. And the plan B is, is no good compared to the plan A. It really isn't. And everyone's telling Rishi Sunak that. And yet he's still not budging. And what should scare you even more is that Rishi Sunak is the one that pulled the plug on Erasmus+. Plus. Boris Johnson had been promising that this isn't under threat at all. But Rishi Sunak, who's the Chancellor, said, no, I don't think we can afford it. We're going to do something else. And instead of having this brilliant exchange scheme, which is so good for our, our students and our youth, because it's wider than just students, and our universities, he just decided we're going to invent a new programme off the cuff, untested, to help you know push out UK students without the counterflow in of all of that European talent to our universities. Our higher education is one of the greatest exports that we have. And furthermore, it's an export that we do on our own soil. People come here to live here, spend money here, invest in the economy here, network here, and allow our students to network with them there. That, you know, that is a massive win to have that drawing. And Rishi Sunak decided that that was just going to get scrapped on a whim. And so now the whole of the UK science community is being sort of held hostage by whatever his whim is. When I know that, you know, that the, the top scientists and the science minister, they all know that, that the preference by a long way is rejoining Horizon Europe. So this, this uh, it, it, just, it just goes to show that, that you, can, you can give someone like Rishi Sunak the opportunity of, of a real solution to the problems they have in, in, in Northern Ireland, you know, make it really nice for them, be really helpful, but still they're going to um, make really stupid decisions about things like Erasmus+, Plus, Horizon Europe, and this retained EU law bill, which is so nuts that it is even deeply embarrassing lots of Conservative peers in the House of Lords that, that just can't argue for it. Um, we, we really need to clear this government out. We, we really do, like big time. I mean, if you're looking at what they're doing, it's absolutely unprecedented. There's no benefits in anything that they're doing. It's all slash and burn. Um, where you're looking at the retained EU law bill, or if you're looking at, at the policy on, on um, immigrants and refugees, it's all about wedge issues and rhetoric. Populism, here's the thing, populism, what really defines it is not that it's popular, it's that when there are problems, you're not seeking to fix them. When there are problems, you're seeking to exploit them. And that is what this government is doing, left, right and centre. They are a government who can't govern. They are a government that just seeks to exploit problems in, in a desperate way, whilst also uh, lining their own pockets for, for them and their friends. It really is a corrupt cabal. And that's what I'm going to finish uh, tonight's uh, little chat on. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm just seeing some of the comments popping up. Uh, John's saying they scrapped Erasmus because they knew people who do it become natural EU supporters. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of that in it. Um, I, I think it's, um, Nicholas Sturgeon called it cultural vandalism. And that's what I think it is. It was, um, it was deliberate um, cultural vandalism for that reason. Dario says logic has nothing to do with their decisions. I think there is some logic in it but the logic is not focused on the problems and the nation and building a better nation. Um, the logic is very much focused on their own interests and their own survival. And I think that's very clear. Um, what's this? Horizon is a way forward for UK science. Where are they holding Northern Ireland protocol over our membership? Um, so, Essentially, um, 
you could say, oh, the EU is playing hardball with our membership of, of science. But then again, um, there is a fundamental legal reason why the EU felt that they needed to do that. And that is because the, um, the protocol was part of the withdrawal agreement. And because the withdrawal agreement was signed and agreed, they could then do the trade and um, collaboration uh, agreement, the, the trade and cooperation agreement, the TCA. Um, and then it was after that that it looked like the UK was pulling the rug on it. So how do you say, oh, yes, we'll go and sign a new contract when you're in the middle of potentially pulling uh, another contract that was foundational to this one that we would then sign? That's that's why it was um, it, it was absolutely not on. Right. Um, I'm going to... Thank you, Anne. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to stop popping these up, and I'm going to uh, get off now and, and get a good night's sleep. But there we go. There's the update. There's the summary, and I will be looking at comments now on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, and I will reply to those there and catch you soon.